I'm humbled uh, to be uh, lodged here in between the people that I admire so much. Um, in particular, our guest of honor, uh, Professor Dworkin, who has been um, uh, not an actual teacher to me as he has to some of the other panelists, as we haven't known each other, but um, truly a personal hero of mine for decades because of his work uh, and his contribution, I think, to building a sense of optimism in the study of human institutions. The hardest part of being here is that I'm asked to challenge this personal icon um, and try to press him on some of the implications of his views. And there is one uh, aspect of his work that has troubled me for a great deal of time, and so this was an opportunity, I thought, to talk about that and to ask him face to face to elaborate on his thinking uh, on this particular issue. We will now move uh, abruptly to the real, real world. Uh, uh, as Jeremy says, the miserably real world. Uh, 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 because I, the topic I wanted to speak about, as was mentioned, is something that's of real interest, uh, current salience, particularly in Western Europe, Scandinavia, Canada, uh, and really sh all over the world, and on which uh, my country, the United States, uh, has ex interestingly different views from just about all other democratic nations, and that is the issue of whether, in theory, it can ever be a proper act of a just government to restrict the utterance of speech promoting hatred against a group of persons. I believe Professor Dworkin's answer to that question would be a categorical no, um, and so I want to use the time that I have to lay out some contours of possibly uh, ways in which he could elaborate on that no and um, help, help me understand his answer better. So since I get to speak first, I'll shamelessly use that advantage to set the definitions uh, to my to, to make the best possible case for the position I hope to defend. And uh, so that means what I'd like to talk about, at least at the beginning, is what I would consider the real core, and almost at a, 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 in a theoretical way, uh, the speech that lies at the core of the principles we'll be talking about, and not those at the periphery, which are a little bit harder, I think, to resolve. But so the core speech would be speech that explicitly denigrates a subset of the political community and challenges its right to full enjoyment of societal opportunity. This is speech that publicly denies the equal political or moral status of some group uh, of people in the polity. In English, there is a word that I think is perfect uh, as far as it, its etymology goes, its etymological derivation, perfect to describe this um, concept, although its usage has not been quite as precise as I would like to uh, use it today, and that is the word disparaging. It's perfect because it comes from the Latin disparare, meaning to render unequal. And its first coining was in the 13th century Old French, disparage, which was used to describe a person who marries someone of a lower social status and in effect creates an inequality for the family by so doing. So it is the rendering unequal by lessening. And that is the sense in which I'm going to use disparaging speech today. And that is the type of speech in particular that I would like to talk about, not speech that uh, is hurtful or offensive in some other type of way. So the question is, is it possible that speech can be so disparaging in the sense uh, denying the basic equal status of some subset of the community that a just state should have the power, or dare I mention perhaps even the obligation, to suppress or punish it? So, as all followers of Ronald Dworkin know, equality must be our starting point. It plays a foundational role in his conception of a political community and uh, his ideas regarding constitutionalism. Simply put, the defining objective of a dem democratic government is to treat all members of the community with equal concern and respect, as we've heard discussed quite a bit already this morning. That principle of equal concern and respect in turn gives rise um, to many of the features of um, democratic institutions, of constitutional institutions that we're familiar with, such as um, majority rule, 
um, accountability of public officials, the right to vote, um, and an array of basic individual freedoms um, that are all tied to this status of each individual as an equal member of the polity. So freedom of speech itself, for Dworkin, I believe, is a function of equality. I, will, I would like to raise in my remarks two uh, different types of questions um, arising from that um, definitional uh, position regarding the source and nature of the freedom of speech uh, with its source inequality. The first addresses the justification for freedom of speech. Many other theorists, other than Professor Dworkin, believe that freedom of speech is protected because of the instrumental value it has in making democracy work better. The instrumental justification emphasizes the societal benefits we get from having a free flow of ideas. Voters and public officials alike tend to make better decisions, they're better informed, truth uh, is more likely to emerge if the public discussion is open and uninhibited. The famous marketplace of ideas metaphor, which is used widely in the United States, is an argument of this nature, suggesting that free speech is more likely to produce truth and wisdom for its society, um, enabling a sort of Darwinian struggle uh, for ideas among different points of view with the strongest and best uh, emerging, emerging victorious in the end. So if this instrumental justification for protecting speech were all that we had, it seems to me that the question of whether hate speech could be regulated would be relatively easy. Uh, I think it would be largely an empirical inquiry into whether on balance the damage to be expected from this type of speech, the type of the violence and psychic injury to victims, uh, ethnic tensions and the like, whether that damage is more costly than depriving the marketplace of these particular ideas. Now, some courts have upheld hate speech restrictions on exactly that theory, and it's not so hard to do because hate propaganda has very little, if any, value to truth uh, in the first place and can certainly plausibly be thought not to contribute to the end of better policy uh, under any definition. Not too much heavy lifting is required to decide that in the end it's um, permissible for a government to regulate it on this theory. The US Supreme Court, although it has not permitted regulation of hate speech, it takes a much more absolute view of freedom of speech, uh, still nonetheless does so on a similar, for the most part, a similar instrumental view of free speech. Uh, however, it doesn't come out um, in favor of regulation on a, a, a roughly, I would say, instrumental idea that we, it's difficult to um, vest the discretion in any government official as to what the value of speech is. So it's really a, almost a consequentialist uh, concern, I think, about a slippery slope argument about um, uh, not whether it's theoretically possible to weigh sp the value of speech versus the cost, but practically how would we do it and whom would we entrust with such a difficult uh, job as deciding which speech has value and which does not. And so the Supreme Court of the United States has taken a hard line um, against regulation, but largely on instrumental concerns. Now, I, as I understand Professor Dworkin's view, he has a different uh, rationale for why we have freedom of speech in the first place, why it needs to be protected in a democracy. The overarching obligation of government is to treat its members as equals, and that uh, gives rise to a constitutive justification for the freedom of speech. A just government has an obligation to treat all its members as people who can make up their own minds. The respect part, I suppose, of equal concern and respect, that, that, that its people may make judgments about what is good and bad, what is truth and false, falsity, what is justice and injustice, belief and disbelief. Therefore, there is a moral status involved um, that is important to both the listener, the potential listener, hearer of the speech, and the potential speaker. It is an insult to the dignity of an audience if the government determines that its people are not fit to hear a particular point of view, and similarly, it's an insult to the speaker um, if he is told that his views disqualify him from uh, speaking as he chooses to do so. so Notice that the robustness of this argument for the protection of free speech does not depend at all on the value 
of any speech, or even the likelihood that society is ultimately better off for having more speech rather than less. Instead, it emphasizes the value of the government's validation of its people on responsi as responsible moral agents, leaving the ultimate judgments to them. It is all about the government's relationship to its people. So there is no argument here that this, this speech loses its protection because of uh, its lack of social value. But it is nonetheless exactly this construction of the basis for a freedom of speech that I would suggest perhaps indicates that there may in fact still be some speech, excuse me, that cannot be protected, consistent with the government's obligation to all its people. So the question is a little bit hard to phrase without sounding a little ridiculously confusing and tautological, but let me try. So if the freedom of speech owes its existence to the government's obligation to respect all members of the community, what attendant obligation also arises on the government to insist that this right be exercised in a way that respects the very principle that gives rise to it? So we feel perhaps as if we're trapped in an M.C. Escher drawing with the perspective moving in and out on us. We, you know, what, what, are we, what are our fixed points? But I do think that there's an important question there that can really be addressed, and I'm hoping Professor Dworkin will talk about it. As a theoretical matter, can the right be absolute, even to the point that it begins to corrode the very principle, I, that is equality, that gives uh, it, its claim to absolute protection in the first place? Or does it come with some theoretical limit, allowing freedom of speech only up to the point at which it threatens the premise of equal status for all members of the polity? Now, Professor Dworkin emphasizes the importance of viewing the right to speak freely as an essential aspect of being a participant an equal participant in a democracy. He goes so far as to draw a parallel between spe speaking and the ultimate democratic participation, the right to vote. He says that to deny a person the freedom to speak is as illegitimate as denying him an equal vote, no matter how hateful the opinion he wishes to propagate. So the analogy would seem at first to strengthen the intuition about the absolute nature of the right to speak, but I'd like to think about that some more. So think about speaking and voting. Both are symbolic acts representing membership in a political community, and they also are both acts which have substantive content beyond the mere participatory message. So when we speak, we say something, and when we vote, we vote for something or against something. So thus far, the analogy seems to hold. But in some sense, the right to vote is not absolute either. It too, derived from the basic equality of all citizens, has been limited in the substance of what can be accomplished through the vote. Famous example, of course, in post-1954 United States, after the decision in Brown versus Board of Education, if a person casts a vote for racial segregation in our public schools, the resulting law is invalid. It cannot be enforced, even if a majority of people vote for it, indeed, even if a unanimous uh, number of people vote for it. The reason it cannot be enforced is that such a law contradicts the fundamental commitment to our of, our, of our democracy to equality. In that sense, the segregationists, the person who voted for this law to segregate the schools, that person's fundamental right to vote has been limited so that it cannot compromise the principle they gave rise to it. Could the analogy continue then to speech? While a person still may speak, perhaps like the vote, that freedom could be limited when the content of the speech also runs afoul of the fundamental commitments of our democracy, such as if the person wished to say that children of one race are not fit to sit beside those of another in public school, the verbal equivalent, let's say, of the racial segregation law. The segregationist statement challenges the very conditions of political community. 
Is it to be distinguished solely on the ground that it is a statement instead of a social practice? The, that's an important question, not a rhetorical question. That's really the, uh, something we have to address. But it seems to me that if we are considering this uh, right of, abs of freedom of speech at a constitutive level, as I think Professor Dworkin wants to do, rejecting an instrumental analysis of the freedom of speech, then it seems to me the difference between expression and legislation is not so obvious. We should not have to worry here in our description, discussion of this theoretical issue about whether the expression is effective, whether people believe it, whether it is ever considered an incitement to action, um, or other kinds of concerns that might affect the instrumental analysis, whether it actually harms society in any sense. What matters, I think, to the way we're talking about it is that the speech itself compromises the principle of equality just as the segregation law does. So to defend the absolute nature of the freedom of speech by saying that it is like the right to vote does not resolve the matter for me. In both cases, it seems at least possible that the government has an obligation to limit the right to avoid a disparaging effect on members of the political community. I'll try to sum up quickly so Professor Dworkin will have a chance to respond, but there is a second way in which the protection of disparaging speech I think may subvert political equality in Professor Dworkin's own sense of the word. This involves equality as it relates to the utilitarian counting of preferences in our society. As I understand it, Professor Dworkin accepts a kind of utilitarianism if it means that each person's preferences count equally in determining the direction society will go. So equality demands that each person's preference count for no more, no less than one, as far as what we prefer. Professor Dworkin uses this idea effectively, I think, to show that some laws um, are less legitimate, perhaps, than others, or at least have less uh, weight. He very persuasively explains why some preferences are consistent with the egalitarian notion of utilitarianism, and some are not. So for example, if I, my preference is to build a symphony hall in my community, I can express that preference through democratic processes, however, uh, it, it, whatever is available to me, and my preference deserves as much weight as anyone else's, no more, no less. But what if my preference is that married couples not be permitted to use contraceptives? That is still a preference, but Professor Dworkin identifies that kind of preference as, ex, as what he calls external um, and as somewhat compromising of the equal counting principle. Instead of just voicing a preference for how I wish my life, I wish to live my life or how to construct my life, I'm the, in that example using my voice or my vote uh, to cancel out someone else's preference about how she wishes to live her life in addition to expressing my own personal preference for my own. So that is inconsistent with the principle of equality. There's a double counting problem uh, that I'm trying to get the benefit of if I take that position about controlling someone else's life. And I would like to suggest that the disparaging hate speech suffers from a ver variety of some sort, some kind of variation on that double counting problem. The person who disparages the equal status of others like the one who seeks to control the private behavior of others, is voicing a preference that has implications for how another lives his or her life. In the case of disparaging speech, I think it could go even further than the sort of morals legislation about contraceptives or whatever other private behavior because it disparages the very status of the person across the board in every aspect of the person's life in the community, not just prohibiting one particular um, activity. So while of course there are differences between the enactment of legislation restricting certain behavior and uh, disparaging speech, I, I don't mean to minimize the differences between the two. The question I would like to pose nonetheless is whether there are not also troublingly sim similar aspects between those two examples. In both cases, the person is using her status in the society as an equal. And so we know that it's not voting and it's not being nominally called an equal member that 
that uh, satisfies the requirement of a moral membership. So could it be <coughs> that this idea of moral membership includes a protection from disparagement? Um, and could it even include perhaps an obligation on government to uh, protect against that disparagement? This is an issue that, as you, as you said, divides nations, divides continents. And you've, you've put the case particularly forcefully for the view I don't hold. So, I'm going, <laughs> so, so I'm going to try. And, uh, I'm very grateful because that's a w wonderful presentation of the, of the case to be answered. And I'm not sure that I'll persuade anyone in this room or many people in this room. This is one of those issues that it seems to me background, background forms in people an opinion. We uh, Americans, uh, many Americans have grown up in, in freedom from the kind of terror that hate speech gets associated with in Europe. Not all Americans, because hate speech has been a terrible problem, in, particularly in the racial dimension in America. Can I be, can I be heard yeah. properly? Uh, <clears throat> now, what I find particularly helpful is that you direct your attention to the core issue, setting aside two other issues that I think, as you put it, are peripheral. One is the question of incitement. That is somebody who says, let's lynch, let's, let's, let's get that Jew and teach him a lesson. This is not what we're talking about. The Constitution, as understood by the Supreme Court, does not reach, uh, does not protect inciting speech and doesn't protect fighting words in the famous formulation. So we're talking about somebody who, in a calm moment, disparages another race and says they ought not to be here, they ought not to have the same rights as others, exactly what you're talking about. This is, we're also not talking about the particular case that I find very hard to think about, which is the situation of a country in danger of <clears throat> falling into totalitarianism. We're not talking about the so-called suicidal constitution that protects the, those who want to undermine the liberal government. We're just talking about our countries as they're now constituted and what's permissible. And you raise first the question of whether there isn't uh, an internal dynamic in my argument for the protection of free speech, which also encompasses a limitation of free speech. And I think the first point I'd want to make, you might not ac accept this point, is one of asymmetry. I regard the government, that is to say us collectively in our political mode, as having responsibilities that we do not have as individuals towards one another. I think this is a, a, an important thing constantly to attend to. I think it's very important, for example, that we be able to say that government has a responsibility of equal concern for every member of the community without suggesting something I find absurd, which is that I, as an individual, should have an equal concern for your, grand, for your children as I have for my grandchildren. I don't. I have more concern for my grandchildren uh, as an individual agent. But when I vote and act politically, I'm not entitled to have that disparate concern. So I think that's a very important distinction, and I think it's particularly important on the respect side. I don't think it's right 
to suppose that people have, people are entitled not to be ridiculed by their fellow citizens. People are ridiculed right and left. Some are ridiculed for believing in God, others are ridiculed for not believing in God, and we don't want a society in which ridicule and, yes, hatred and certainly opposition and disparagement are somehow eliminated from civil society. Think what that would take as a general principle. But at the same time, we must insist that the government that speaks for us all, that is ourselves in our political manifestation, that that government doesn't <coughs> distinguish among us and elevate some to a superior class over others. We have to keep, it seems to me, constantly in mind this duality of public and private. Now, that is why I think that it doesn't follow from government's requirement of neutrality that government must impose neutrality on individuals. Now, I come to the question of I mean, that's my answer, I think, to the first question, the question of why the constitutive justification doesn't carry over into an obligation to impose constraints on, on what individuals can do. Now I come to the analogy with the vote. And at first I want to notice that in the case of the United States, our Constitution can be amended. The Equal Protection Clause could, in theory, be amended. It won't happen. It would be appalling if it uh, were even attempted. But the constitutional structure of our country, and indeed most countries that have a constitution, allows the populace as a whole, through supermajorities, to change anything. Now that connects, it seems to me, with the main point I want to make about the connection between speech and legitimacy. We collectively impose constraints on each of us as individuals. For example, we forbid discrimination in employment. That is resented by many people in our community. We also, we do other things. We, in some states of the United States, allow homosexuals to marry. We forbid certain kinds of discrimination against homosexuals in employment and indeed even lately in the military. What entitles us to coerce others who disapprove of these steps. Others who say, I'm entitled to hire the people I feel comfortable with in my company. I don't want a black person or a Jew sitting in my office. What entitles us collectively to impose that kind of a law? I believe that we are entitled to do that in part because we have given them an opportunity to oppose the legislation that we ultimately adopt through majoritarian procedures or sometimes through judicial procedures. We have given them an opportunity to speak out in objection. If we didn't give them the opportunity, I think our legitimacy in imposing these constraints on them would be compromised. Why? I go back to something that I said a while ago this morning, which is that, in my view, democracy is not simply majority vote. It's majority vote under conditions that make it fair to impose a collective decision on individuals. And I believe, though I recognize this is controversial, that it is one of those conditions 
that people are given equal voice in the deliberation before the decision is taken. Is that hard on some people in the community? Was it hard for people in Skokie, Illinois, who were refugees from the Holocaust or descendants of those refugees, when Nazis marched through the center of their town? Yes, it was hard. Living in a society that cherishes democratic legitimacy and cherishes free speech and the right to ridicule as part of legitimacy is sometimes hard. I have had students of all conviction, all kinds of conviction, tell me that they feel uncomfortable in Greenwich Village because their views are so often held up to ridicule. It's hard for them, too. But that is the price that we pay, it seems to me, for the kind of legitimacy that we should insist on. It's the price we pay for freedom. Having a, having a slightly tougher skin is not as hard as risking the kind of censorship that can one day bite us, too. That's my case. It won't, as I say, convince people because the horror for many people of this kind of speech is vivid. But it does seem to me a case that needs to be answered before we can put people in jail for denying the Holocaust. It's a case that has to be answered, and it can only be answered by constructing a theory of legitimacy that allows us to say to people, you have to obey this law that you hate, even though you were not allowed to speak to the rest of the nation, fairly and fully expressing your convictions of hatred. I don't think we can construct such a theory. Can right. I ask a follow-up, yes. and then maybe people will have yes. questions? Um, just one thing, which is, um, so, the opportunity to speak out is, in a way, the compensation we give people in a democracy for losing uh, is sort of what I'm hearing you say, because we know that the debate can continue and we have an opportunity to challenge rules we don't like. That's all clearly right, but it presumes that there's something to be debated here. And I guess my real question to you then is, why, are there preconditions of democracy, equal status being one of them, that are not up for debate? I mean. It seems to me that idea of debate and free discussion of disputes is based on the idea of equality. Um, if you deny the very equality uh, of the people that you're dis disagreeing with, it seems to cut off the possibility of really having a public discussion of the issues. If I say, you are not worthy to, hear, to speak to me, how can we talk about it? Um, and it strikes me that, that you seem to assume that the equal status of all citizens is up for discussion, and I thought that it was a condition. That means that it was a given, and that we couldn't really challenge that. Well, that's, I don't think it's a condition. That, I don't think there's anything oh, okay. that we can't challenge. Uh, and that's because we want to be confident. This isn't about the marketplace of ideas. Nor is it about compensation for losing. That, I think, puts it the wrong way around. We don't say, you've got the privilege of saying these vile things as compensation for losing. We say, it's because you had the privilege, among other things, that we are justified in forcing you to obey our anti-discrimination laws. That's, that's how the mm. argument goes. And you say, there ought to be some things off the table, not up for discussion. Two problems. First, a problem we haven't thus far talked about, but it really does belong in the conversation someplace, which is that any attempt to say exact, more exactly what is off the table would run into terrible difficulties. I mean, if you said, consider, for example, the debate about gay marriage that rages in the United States now. Is that 
Is it off the table for someone to say marriage is a sacred institution? It would be defiled by this kind of a union attracting the title of marriage. Well, that's a kind of hate speech. It's often fueled by people who are simply disgusted at people who are different from what they are. But I wouldn't suppose that, we would, that it would be right to prohibit people from making that statement. Now, you might say, well, the line, there's all, there are always line drawing problems, and there are some things that are, in your word, so plainly disparaging that, that we could limit the censorship to those. I'm not so confident we could. I think any chink we made in the principle of free speech would attract the hydraulic power of a great <laughs> many people yeah. who say, well, my view must be protected as well. So the difficult, the opening, I think the, what you call the absolute position is by far the safest one against that kind of problem. But I also think that that isn't the only problem. I do think, even if we were clear, that there was a certain kind of view. We want to legislate, we want to enforce our sense, our collective sense of equality against people who hate it. And we need to have given them the chance to speak, in my view, before it's legitimate to do it. Now, uh, you very... <coughs> You very nicely said, we're concentrating on core cases. I have to say that if I thought the Nazis were about to take over, or the races were about to take over, I might have to think again. In a way, my position is one that we can afford as a matter of luxury. But what we gain in our luxury is something quite valuable. We can say to people, you have to obey our law because you were treated as an equal citizen in the debate leading up to it. Right, we're slightly over time, but I think just because of the interest in the, this debate, that, that we take one question, maybe a short one, just because of the time. Fine. Well, thank you. Jan Fritjof Bernd uh, speaking. Uh, my question to you is, uh, when you uh, at the end of your argument said that we can afford the freedom of speech, even for hate speech, as a matter of luxury, you are, in a sense, indicating that this is a balancing process. You also said a moment ago, uh, as I started, that this was uh, a question of having a, distinguish, a distinction between uh, uh, speech and incitement. Yes. So I would say that when you determine what is considered uh, incitement that could be punished under the law, you should always look into the actual situation. To what extent does this really create a danger and a fear for the people? Yes. Meaning that actually I think that we should not discuss this issue as a matter of um, uh, interpreting the principle of freedom of speech, but we should in discuss it as a matter of the balance between one important principle, the, the, the freedom of speech, on the other hand, another important principle, the right to live in a safe society, feeling, being a part of it. I'm, <clears throat> yes, incitement. We haven't talked about that, and there are difficult cases about the boundaries of incitement. The principle I would argue for, however, is that insult can't be considered a clear and present danger. If violence is around the corner, then we begin to worry. And balancing may be an appropriate metaphor to use. But I don't want to balance sensitivity and insult against free speech. 